Hello, this is Nick of Time with the 25th talk on our series on the physics of time. As you can see, this is part two, so you have to have seen the prior talk, talk 24, before seeing this talk to really understand it. The previous talk gives the background for this talk. Topic is relativists misunderstanding the role of inertial frames. And that causes lots of problems and in addition serves as a major obstacle to the relativists seeing and understanding those problems. And here we'll go into two examples using the twin paradox and uh, GPS. <coughs> Okay, as a transition, this chart uh, was shown in the prior talk, and we had three bullets. Each bullet represented a different, contradictory, mutually exclusive uh, definition of the role of uh, inertial frames in special relativity. Unfortunately, all three were accepted by relativists, sometimes all of them explicitly accepted and sometimes some were explicitly accepted and some were implicitly accepted. It varies from relativist to relativist. But this is a common problem for relativists. Okay, we'll just talk about the first uh, role of inertial frames in special relativity. Special relativity was constructed and explicitly articulated as applying to inertial frames, specifically inertial frames with transformation between inertial frames and relative velocity between inertial frames. So the view was that special relativity uh, discussed the physics of inertial frames. Now, I mention that because some who are not familiar with the history of special relativity or familiar with the literature on special relativity might uh, be skeptical and say, oh no, that, that couldn't have been the, the view that was accepted. But we'll go and we'll show not only was it accepted early, but it's still being explicitly articulated today along with the other contradictory views. Okay, let's talk about the twin paradox. We've gone into discussing the twin paradox in some depth, so let's use that base of knowledge here. And we'll talk about the relativist first reconciliation argument when presented with the twin paradox. Okay, first we'll talk about the twin paradox scenario. It involves two identical clocks that start together in an inertial frame and one of those clocks accelerates to be in different inertial frames. One inertial frame going out and one inertial frame uh, coming back to the starting point. And the result of that scenario is claim to be a net proper time difference, which means that the traveling twins clock accumulated proper time more slowly between the event of the start of the round trip and the finish of the round trip. So, say it colloquially, the traveling twins clock slowed at least in terms of accumulating proper time. Okay, the critique of that claim, that special relativity claim, is that special relativity would also yield the opposite result using the traveling twins view if special relativity were to be applied consistently to that view. Well, 
what was the relativist rebuttal? They say the traveling twin is not an inertial frame all the time. Therefore, one can't use the traveling twin's view and using special relativity. So there we have a rather explicit statement that special relativity is confined to inertial frames. Now we'll take a deeper look at general relativity and that very same claim is echoed when relativists talk about GPS. Okay, GPS was claimed to be built on special relativity and general relativity when talking about gravitational potential. Okay, when GPS was first conceived and designed, relativity was the in theory, the accepted theory, and preferred frame theory was on the outs. It had been dismissed, and even worse, it had really been forgotten. So, there was no real analysis as to whether the model that GPS was using was the relativistic model or a preferred frame theory model. Um, it, the assumption was it was special relativity and that assumption, that unfortunate assumption, that erroneous assumption, has continued today uh, in relativist thinking. Okay, when the GPS data is shown to contradict special relativity, the relativists claim that special relativity does not apply to GPS because GPS uses non-inertial clocks. That's the relativist strategy for trying to quote-unquote save special relativity from this mismatch between GPS data and special relativity theory. So how do they explain the empirical data on clock slowing due to velocity? Well, he tried to address the problem saying it's handled by general relativity. But general relativity doesn't address velocity-dependent clock slowing. And further, empirical data from particle accelerators shows there is no dependence on acceleration per se. Obviously, acceleration uh, causes a change in instantaneous velocity, and that change in instantaneous velocity affects clock rate. But there's no dependence on acceleration per se. It doesn't have any effect above and beyond the effect of instantaneous velocity. Okay, we'll go over that again, but we're going to make a separate point, equally telling. Uh, I originally titled this relativist uh, abandoning critical thinking, but to abandon something, you first have to embrace it. So, um, we see fairly consistently relativists just abstain from any critique of relativity. Again, this is repeat, same as last time, but it leads to a different point. Relativists claim GPS is built on special relativity. But, when GPS data is shown to be at odds with special relativity, the relative this rebuttal is that since the Earth and satellite clocks were non-inertial, that data, the GPS data that was at odds with special relativity, is outside special relativity's domain. And, and they allege that argument saves special relativity. But, the relativists continue to claim, in separate contexts, that GPS is built on special relativity. So 
So here we have these multiple conflicting interpretations of um, the role of inertial frames in special relativity, which leads to multiple conflicting uh, mutually exclusive interpretations of other aspects of special relativity. Okay, let's look at this a little more closely. Relativists still argue that GPS uses special relativity. Let's examine that claim. Relativists say that because GPS uses the satellite clock's velocity with respect to an inertial frame, namely the ECI frame, and the earthbound clock's velocity with respect to an inertial frame, that means GPS is using special relativity. Okay, let's take a closer look at that argument. And we, this slide has no title, but it's continuing uh, the previous topic, and we'll look at the argument in detail. Okay, the velocity of the earthbound clocks and the velocity of the satellite clocks respectively relative to the ECI frame are used to separately compute the velocity effects on each set of clocks. In other words, uh, we take the earthbound clocks and take their relative velocity to a virtual clock at rest in the uh, ECI frame and use that as a piece of data one. And then we take a look at the satellite clock's velocity relative to a clock in the ECI frame and get another piece of data. And then we go on to and we compute um, how the earthbound clock's rate compares to that virtual clock in, at rest in the ECI frame, and separately how the satellite clock rate compares to that virtual clock rate in the ECI frame. And then we go to bullet two when we say, and then a ratio of the velocity effects on each uh, set of clocks is calculated to determine the relative clock rates between earthbound clocks and the satellite clocks. Thus, special relativities, relative velocity between two clocks is not used to determine relative clock rates, but rather a local absolute velocity with respect to a single frame, in this case the so-called ECI frame, is used. We'll look forward. Thus, the S, the special relativity model, is not used in GPS, but instead Lorentz relativity model is used, or a preferred frame model is used. Now we're going to look at that in even more detail and it should become quite clear that that's true. Let's see where we go. And we've se you've seen this before but it's worth going into because it's very important to understand you're going to understand the role or lack of role of special relativity in GPS, and hence the role that special relativity should play in the, in the physics of time. Okay, using a third-party frame to determine 
the relative clock rate between a, clock A and clock B is not part of special relativity. And we'll go through that in the diagram below. At the bottom, we have clock A and clock B. They're separating from each other. Now, let's see, we select the third party uh, inertial frame, and we'll select C. And to start, we'll have C b take a uh, state of motion where it's halfway between a motion of clock A and a motion of clock B. So from C's point of view, it looks like A is going to the left with velocity V, and that B is going to the right with that same velocity V, but, you know, going in the opposite direction. So, if we apply special relativity to this third-party frame, what do we conclude about clock A relative to clock B? Well, uh, first, C is going to say that clock A is moving with respect to C, hence clock A is going to be going at a slower rate than clocks in C. But then when he looks at clock B, he sees the, really the same thing, except the direction has changed. So he'll say the clock B is going slow with respect to the clocks, clocks in, at rest in C, and going slow by the same rate that the clock in A are going slow with respect to the clocks in C. So he'll conclude that clocks in A and the clocks in B are going at the same rate, <laughs> as they both slow down by the same amount with respect to his clocks. All right, but now let's say we choose a different uh, state of motion for clock C. We'll have him be in an inertial frame that's going uh, at almost exactly the same st state of motion as uh, clock A. What's he going to conclude then? Well, he's going to conclude that the B clocks are running slower than his clock, and they're also running slower than the A clocks, because the A clocks would be running just about the same speed as the C clocks. So that's a different conclusion than what we had before. Now let's Pick a third state of motion for uh, this third party uh, inertial frame. And we'll have the C frame state of motion be uh, almost exactly the same as the B clock. And now we'll come to a third contradictory conclusion, namely that the clocks in A are moving slower than the clocks in C and B in this, in this particular case. So, one can't uh, use that third-party model and use special relativity because you get all sorts of different answers. If you build GPS on that assumption that you could take arbitrarily take any third-party uh, inertial frame and apply special relativity, you'd have people driving into other people's living room. And GPS would giving off all sorts of misinformation. The only reason it's correct is they, they're not using the special relativity model, they're using the preferred frame model, and they happen to have correctly stumbled on a, a very natural choice for their preferred frame model, namely the, the ECI frame, a, a natural choice at least in the vicinity of Earth. So that's a very important slide to remember, very important picture to remember. Okay, so what's our conclusion? From the empirical data, from GPS data, well, we asked the rhetorical question, what's the role of inertial frames in space-time physics? And the answer is none. <laughs> At least there should be none. The physical effects on clocks are caused by local interaction with physical entities. Well, they're not caused by abstract constructs, math constructs like 
uh, inertial frames or frames, any kind of frame, non-inertial frames. Uh, and in reality, forces have no effect on abstract math constructs like frames, whether they're inertial or non-inertial. What matters for clocks, for example, is their absolute velocity with respect to a physical entity. And in addition, uh, optionally, how it experienced local forces, if there are local forces. Okay, here's a footnote. Yes, uh, one can use the term frame as a convenient shorthand or if the physical entity that's causing physical effects is unknown. And you can do that as long as both the presenter and the listener are uh, both aware of the above. That, that frame is an unfortunate but necessary substitution for talking in terms of physical entities if the physical entity is unknown. You have to use some, some term. A few more closing footnotes. Um, for the vicinity of the Earth, we discuss velocity with respect to our preferred frame, namely the non-rotating so-called Earth-centered inertial frame. We do that because we do not know which physical entity that motion with respect to causes those clock slowing effects. That physical entity does not have to be inertial, by the way. Sorry about the misspelling. Uh, it happens that uh, if you're near a massive body that uh, the preferred frame will tend to be very close to being inertial, but it, it doesn't have to be perfectly inertial because even if it's a massive body, it is affected to some degree or the local physics uh, uh, that the physical entities are operating in, that environment, they're still affected to some degree by external uh, physical entities, uh, by a fields. So uh, uh, the preferred frame may not be an inertial frame. Uh, and finally, it's, it's not the Earth per se that's causing the clock slowing, and that uh, we're measuring absolute velocity against as the Earth rotates. But likely it's something like the local gravitational field, uh, a non-rotating uh, physical entity in the Earth's locale. Okay, just a final note. Um, the problem with focusing on frames when you're constructing a theory and interpreting uh, a physics theory uh, is that they are really abstract math constructs. And even worse, in this particular case for special relativity, um, even in the, that context of abstract math constructs of frames, they made a mistake uh, in the way that they use multiple frames uh, incorrectly. So that concludes that topic. I know it's a difficult topic because it's not about, the point is not about pure physics, it's a talk about um, really the psychology or inner workings of the mind that has created 
special relativity and that causes people to continue to cling to special relativity in the face of the most glaring logic errors. As Professor Dingle said, it takes no great intelligence to uh, see that a theory that predicts that clock A is slow with respect to B and B is slow with respect to A has a problem, that theory has a problem. Uh, and we know that the relativists are very smart people. They have great aptitudes for uh, physics and math, and yet uh, that inherent logic problem doesn't seem to bother them. They're also not bothered by if the GPS data, the result is eight and special relativity is calling for minus eight. So we're trying to understand what the problem is above and beyond just being uh, slow about abandoning a beloved belief system. So I hope you've enjoyed today's talk and we'll go on to different topics and thanks for joining us. Hope to see you next time.